14, 15 parts of the spiritual gifts. So we are going to break them down for us to understand them. We introduced the Holy Spirit himself. Who is the Holy Spirit? So that when we see the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we will not be able to treat them with contempt. So it's very important for us to understand. Praise the Lord. So today we are going to introduce what are the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how they manifest. How do I know whether this is a gift of the Holy Spirit? So we are going to be introducing them and how to see from the Bible how these gifts come about. There are nine spiritual gifts seven auxiliary gifts, so there are about 16. I'll be mentioning them and showing them from the Bible. You will see them and then you can identify them. The other one, they are called them auxiliary gifts. So we'll see them from the Bible, nine plus other seven, which like um, hospitality, people who can help to be receiving ministers of God, uh, receiving them, hosting them, these are people, these are gifts that are not directly um, uh, part of the nine gifts that are given directly by the Holy Spirit, administration, finance. These are other gifts that are just added, but they are very essential in running the ministry. But we will be concentrating more on the nine that we will talk about, so that we see how they affect ministry. So in this part of the course that we're going to do, we're going to stay within the limits of the script as the principle. As I say, we teach only from the King's James, which is this one. All scriptures come from here. So any Bible verse that we're going to quote is come from this book, so that we don't confuse one another. If you want to read from somewhere, it's okay. But scriptures will be coming from here. So let us remain, or let us um, remain open to the Holy Spirit who inspired the Holy Scriptures in the first place to teach us what the Bible means, the what letters in the scriptures mean. His inspiration in this regard has been a function of making our hearts mind, will, emotions, and the entire being is available to him to use his instruments to understand the scripture. It's very important for us. So we are introducing, we are not yet getting into it. We just want to understand what the, we are talking about, what are they and how do they manifest? It's just a brief introduction. We want to see what are these spiritual gifts and how do they manifest. So during the address, where there are times where um, from the source where I have asked permission to be using the material teaching material, I have been used, I've been given permission to use the material. They, they usually use the Hebraic names, the Elohim, Yeshua, Yamashak, the Holy Spirit, the Roha, the, the Hebrew name for the Holy Spirit. It doesn't, make it any much more different. The most important thing is to follow the scriptures. So in addressing the various personalities in the Godhead, they chose to follow the Hebraic names, the Aramic names, because the replacement theology, they wanted to, to face them out. It doesn't make much difference anyway. 
It's how you choose. It's like call father dead. You call him dead and you don't show him respect. It doesn't make him any more like you call him father and you don't show him respect. It doesn't add any more value. So the most important thing is, do you honor him as your father? Do you honor him when you call him dead? Do you give him the honor that he serves? Or do you, do you give him the respect that is true with the title that you give, you call him? So they said uh, they use Elohim where it's normally reads God. Elohim is just a plural for God, for the Godhead. That is where this, um, how do I call it? Like uh, in the Bible, they say uh, there are some names which put, like Dan, there are some names which comes in with, um, with ending with him or so. There are some names which they were putting in God. God, Dan, these are names that were ending with God inside. So this, this um, Elohim, that is where they will put God, but this God was like plural. Pl uh, plural. So Elohim, it is, um, it's a plural for the Godhead, for the three unit God. It was not meant for one person. It was meant for like in Genesis 1, 26 to 29, let us make men in our image. That is where plural way they use it. So, but you must not use it. For me, I don't use those Hebraic names. But if you think use English like I do, use English. For the Lord Jesus Christ, they use Yeshua. It doesn't make any much difference. Because for some, they didn't say in the name of Yeshua. I know some people, they use their mother language to cast out a demon. It does work. It doesn't matter which language. It is the state in which you live your life. If you live a holy life, demons obey you. Do you think the 12 or the 70, when they were sent by the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 to 20, when they came rejoicing, where the Lord Jesus Christ was telling them in um that I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. And then he said, rejoice that your names are written in heaven, not that you, the demons are obeying you. Were, were they casting out the devils in, in English? No, they were doing it in, in, in Hebrew, in their own language. So at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily mean which language. It's got to be, it is your standing with God. When Adam was giving those names to animals, do you think it was in English? No. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter which language one uses. It's your standing with God that matters at the end of the day. So let us not spend more time trying to argue about this. So it is a known fact that most of the New Testament was written in Greek. Dominant Gentile language in the first four centuries of the gospel was this, um, they use this lowest, uh, they call it, um, how do you call it, lowest, uh, there's a name they use is the Greek. Let me try to say, the one they call it, the change to Jesus Christ, the lowest, lowest, that is the one they change from Aramic, they change it to Greek, lowest. This is the one they change to. So his redemptive mission, was changed to Messiah, the Redeemer, which was the Arabic term for Ha Mashiach, which is the anointed one, Christos. So they say Jesus, Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. Jesus Christ, this is Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah. That's how it came, it came up. That's why Jesus, Ha Mashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, that's how they changed the name Losus Christus to Jesus the Messiah. So the Greek and English translations of the name Christ of mission to Jesus Christus, they are correct uh, interpretation. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter how people are like uh, tra translated. 
So the spiritual gifts are primary instrument of manifestation, manifestation of the royal priesthood in the order of Melchizedek. So this priesthood now, which Apostle Paul said, um, Apostle Peter, where he was saying, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. This is the priesthood said, we are now a priesthood, which was which, um, Apostle Paul, Apostle uh, Paul wrote that, we are now a priest, we are now priests in the order of Melchizedek. So after the order of Melchizedek, so we need to reflect on the foundation of truth, which is the Holy Spirit needs and uses human vessels to fulfill divine purposes. He needs human beings to work with us. Same with the therefore, he needs human beings to work with us. So we choose to be the vessels of honor or the vessels of so you are you are going to be used of the devil or of God. There's nothing like sitting on the fence. If God does not use you, you are going to be used of the devil. So there are two people who are going to use you, the devil or God. Whether you know it or not, you are, going, you are used of the devil. So the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated that he demonstrated this principle in the earthly um, life in the, the um, Melchizedek order himself that he demonstrated that, um, that he was, when he said, you are now a priest, he said, uh, how did you say? He said, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So why, why was he said you are now a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Remember Father Abraham when he was coming from the defeat of the kings, uh, Chadla Omar and the other kings that had um, taken Lot, had taken his um, nephew. He paid a tenth. He did not pay a tenth from his businesses, no. It was a tenth from the things that is looted from the kings. He was coming from the defeat of the kings when he met this great king. He said he had no genealogy. He had no parents. He had no mother. He had no father. According to the Bible students, they said this is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But we are not going to debate it. It's, it's according to theology. We know it according to Apostle Paul. That is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But it doesn't give you any more value. Whether I, told, whether I tell you that the man that was met in Genesis chapter 14 is the same man that is in, Genesis, in, the, book, in the book of Hebrews, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, it doesn't give you any more value. What gives you the value is to stand with him. It was the Holy Spirit who planted him in the womb of the Mary. Remember Luke chapter 1, verse 35. When Angel Gabriel said to Mary, blessed you amongst the women, he said, ah, how, sir, how is it going to happen? He said, the Holy Spirit will offer shadow thee. Which means the Holy Spirit was going to come upon her in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. So he came over, over here and said, that which is going to be conceived is going to be called the Son of God. So Christ himself did no miracle until the Holy Spirit come upon him bodily. Is it in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, where the Holy Spirit descended in the bodily form, where the Father spoke from heaven and the Holy Spirit was descending in the form of a bed, a dove, and he came and rested upon him. When John the Baptist was baptized, he said, let all righteousness be fulfilled. That's when he said, oh, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. John the Baptist, he said, I want to be baptized by you. He said, no, let all righteousness be fulfilled. So it was the Holy Spirit who let him be tempted. Remember the Luke chapter 4, or the Matthew chapter 4, where he was being tested. It was the Holy Spirit that led him into the wilderness. Tempted. And the devil was quoting that to uh, look and, uh, Psalms 91, verse 11 and 12, where he said, throw yourself, you angels will take charge of you. 
the devil knows the scripture and he misapplies it. So the Lord went into the strength of the spirit to do all the good deeds which are recorded in the four gospels, the Matthew, the Mark, the Luke, and John. These are the four gospels in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when, when you want to understand, if you want, if a new believer or if you want to convert anybody, let them read these four gospels, the four Gnostics. They are enough for somebody to start from. When they read these four, they will understand the gospel. From there, you will start taking them the small books, Romans, Acts, they begin to go, they will begin, their eyes they will begin to be to open up. So they captured the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in the three and a half years. So Acts chapter, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So the greatest ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was deliverance. He was delivering people from people who were oppressed. Remember Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Lord has appointed, anointed me power to deliver the people who were oppressed. He was delivering people. People were born blind, People were like the man at the Bethesda, the woman with the issue of blood, but males, people with the issues, everybody. There was nobody who was told to come tomorrow. People were coming, just come. Nobody was, nobody was asked to pay a seed. The issue of paying seed, we saw it today. Nobody was saying, ah, bless your pastor. Nobody. Can you give me something? I want iPhone 8, you know. Oh, this is your iPhone. Huh? Pastor Lucas says, which, which um, let me see your phone. Ah, iPhone 13. Huh? This is good. Oh. Pastor is busy looking at iPhone 13. Huh? This is fine. You know. 15 times. Now pastor is no longer preaching iPhone 14. Huh? Pastor said, Pastor, I will give you this one if my problem, my problem is finished now. Until he say, Pastor, I'm going to give you this one. Say, true. Say, yes, I'll give you the phone. You are forcing a person to give you a phone. That's not what you are called for. That is a spirit of confessiousness. You need to be deli delivered from that spirit. When people are coming to you for help, they are not supposed to ask for anything from anybody. It's a spirit of covetousness. You close your eyes and minister what God is telling you about this person and that's it. You are an instrument of the devil. When you start seeing in the flesh, because they're supposed to be seeing in the spirit. Because we are teaching about the gifts, spiritual gifts. You have gone to a, self, to a minister of God, a servant of God. You have got a challenge. It could be a spiritual challenge that you, you have gone for. You probably drove with a car. Now, instead of getting help, he's busy saying, huh? So your family is well to do, huh? You have got good jobs. Now he's admiring you. You are probably going to a man who hardly gets one meal a day. That is the person that you are asking to help you. Who needs help between the two of you now? Now he's busy asking God, God, can you give me, can, can you bless me like you bless this person? Now he's praying for God to bless you, to, to, to bless him more like he has blessed you. Before you need, he's praying to get your star, to grace your divine blessings. That's why it's important to learn to pray for yourself. Every problem you're running to somebody. What for? Faith is listed as number three, the gift of faith. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, 
faith, spirit of discernment, number four. These are the four most powerful gifts. We'll work them, we'll go through them, all of them, in terms of their listing and how powerful they are and what they can do and why we need them in that order. Not to come and say, I've got this gift, I've got this gift. Do you know what they do? Because if you don't have faith, you've got nothing. You are praying without faith. And the Bible says without faith, it's impossible. It's impossible to please him. Yeah, he said, I was praying. What were you praying without faith? How do you pray to somebody that you don't even know? That's why this teaching is very important. So that you know him. You are intimate with him. Is it uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 18? Let me digress a little bit. I like this digressing because it's teaching. Teaching is very important. I like to digress a little bit. Just, just give me a minute. Let me digress. Teaching is very important. I don't want to teach and rush because it's very important to teach and give you the necessary scriptures so that you know what it means. Very important to teach and Ezekiel chapter 16 or 18, 16, let me check. Let me check, where is it? I read it a very short while ago. It's a kill. Minute. Okay. I'll, I'll look it for you very soon. I'll find it. I don't know where, how I missed it. Is it 18, 16? I hate it. So where is it? I'll look it for you. I'll look it for you. I want I want it to, to gain it for you. I'll I'll look it for you so I'll think about it. I, I had it in my I think it will be refreshed in my memory. So it's a very powerful face. <clears throat> so interestingly. None of those authors of the gospel accounts could write anything of enduring value except that the Holy Spirit inspired them to capture essential aspects of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. Second Peter chapter one, Dada Chemi, can you read from me second Peter chapter one Amen. Second Peter chapter one, verse 16. To 21. Mm -hmm. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we did not to you and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day Dawn, and the day star arise your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy 
of the scripture is of a need private interpretation, the last verse. For the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So the Bible makes it very clear. Knowing first that prophecy did not come, but it did not come. It said men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So here, the Bible is teaching us that what you think doesn't matter. It's not for private interpretation. We have heard pastors, ministers of God, telling people what they think. It's not what you think, brethren. We have seen saints respecting men of God. I've seen people boasting. I was given an opportunity to minister on Sunday in one of the churches, like I told them, I was asked by the Lord not to take a time wherever I go. So I told them, my gospel does not demand that I take any time. So when I come, I do my thing and go away so I don't expect anything from anyone. So then, so I made it very clear. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18, I wash my hands. Your blood, I'm washing it here. So I will leave your blood here in this arena. I'm done. I'm going. So you make it very clear. I'm not coming for anything. I don't need anything from nobody. So when you finish, I did not come to make friends. If I want friends, I go on Facebook. So make it very clear here for the job to do. Don't come and look anybody in the face. Whoever cry, let them cry. Whoever feel offended, get offended. I would rather offend you because if I offend you, if I if I offend you, I'm still going back home so I can hide from you. But if I offend God, remember when you're doing the teaching about the Holy Spirit, is it in hell? He has got a place there, he will see you. King David said, Where will I hide? So be very careful. You cannot hide away from God. But from men, is it a phone? Phone, I can change my number, I can change a new number. Is it you? I can avoid you. Facebook, I will delete my account. Hmm. You, will, you will not find me anyway. But God, will you, is it Facebook that you are going to use for God? No. How are you going to hide? So we need to be very careful. So in this teaching ministry, the Lord Jesus Christ shared with his disciples the extensive details of who the Holy Spirit is. This, that was our teaching, the two teachings that we did of who the nature of the Holy Spirit his assignments in exalting him. He said, I'm going to teach him. I'm going to send him. I'm going to send you another comforter. Clarifying the essence and the context of the truth which he shared with them. So before ascending to heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ forbade his disciples from going forth with zeal to preach. He said, don't go. Remember, there was a group which went to teach before the Holy Spirit. He said, there are some things, there are some things that stop rushing, don't rush. There are people who want to teach. These are the people who said the resurrection has already happened. Remember, Apostle Paul said, which resurrection? The one that he was preaching in, um, in Thessalonians. They said resurrection happened. They said, which resurrection happened? Which resurrection happened? They said, then we are teaching in vain. People were already teaching because they went without the Holy Spirit. There are people who went already with zeal, which Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse 1, 1 to 3. He confirmed that they have got zeal, but not according to knowledge. I pray that they be saved. These are people who were in church, but they were talking about things they don't know. They are just coming in, they are going to hell. They are going to hell. The issue is not only frightening people to come to church. No, make them understand. Why are they going to hell? Did he come for people to go to hell? No. For God so loved the world. Why did he come? That whosoever believe in him shall have everlasting life. That's why he came. He loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That's why he came. So what happens? He's going to judge men according to this gospel that we are rejecting. So we are bound to accept this gospel. Ah, okay, which is the gospel. So he said, we, we must love him. 
because he created us for his own pleasure. First, teach people what they are supposed to accept. Forget about hell. Hell is there, yes. But don't come and frighten them first. Tell them, you are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. If I refuse, don't tell them if I refuse. You are going to stand there. If you refuse, there is another flip side now. You are diagnosed with a disease. If you refuse to take your medication, your medication, this is what happens. What happens if, if you don't take your medication, what happens? Say I die. Say good. This is the this is the flip side of what you are refusing. If you don't miss heaven, then you are certainly not going to miss hell. Now it's by choice. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15 to 9, uh, verse 15 and 19. Now we are making a choice. God is going to help you fulfill your desire. Ah, okay. But it's not you preaching now they're asking you. But you have preached heaven to them. Ah, okay. Then they make a conscious choice, not out of fear, but out of love, you know, obedience. People are tired of people who are just coming in out of fear. They are not regenerated. They are not born again. They are just coming, sit I don't want to go to hell. I do not want to go to hell. I told pastors when I was given an opportunity to minister to pastors, general overseers, they are not, they are not children of God. I say you became men of God before you were children of God. Very possible that you see a man of God that was not born again. I say, they said, is it possible? Very possible. Very possible indeed. Very possible. Through cleverness, people can say, say come, can you read the Bible? Say yes. You can be coached to present this thing. Yes. Presentation, yes. The letter, you can. That's why I said the Bible says, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. That's why people are not moved. You come, you read the Bible and say, yes, that's the letter, but there's no spirit inside. That's why lives are not being changed. That's why no single soul is kept at. Because why? It was just, time is just being, time just uh, being taken away, like, just like that. So it's very important to move in the spirit. Remember, God is a spirit. He must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. That's why I said, wait for my spirit and it will go before you first and then the more. That, that we can find in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 to 8. So the divine principle is for Holy Spirit to use the vessels of saints as instruments to say and do what the Lord Jesus Christ would have said and done if you were physically present. What would have the Lord Jesus Christ done? He allows us to do. Since the Lord Jesus Christ was glorified, sitting at the right hand side of the Father, God on the throne of Christ, those who are called of his Melchizedek order of priesthood are not left on the earth to proclaim and demonstrate the gospel on the strength of their natural abilities. We are not left to claim in our natural abilities. No, we are here. That's why we are called ambassadors of Christ. Remember uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, we are called ambassadors of Christ. Where it ends up saying, he made him who you not seen to become sin on our behalf. That's why we are called ambassadors of Christ. So each is to receive a measure of unsurpassable power of the Holy Spirit as a means of our identification of the body, as well as um, to release the identification. At uh, how do I call it? Um, we, we, are give, we are given, um, we are supposed to, it's a means to release um, power. We, 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 are, we, are given, we are given that um, as a means to release power, as an instrument to release power to fellow, to fellow human beings, to, to fellow saints by the Holy Spirit. Because when you come in, 
when somebody is sick, when somebody something happens, it could be dead or something. When you release, when you raise somebody from the dead, you are releasing a certain measure of power. Grace is being released through you as an instrument. So the Holy Spirit is using me because the Lord Jesus Christ was, if he was here, that's what he would have done. But I'm not doing it in my human, in, in my human, um, uh, in my human ability. So in this context of his exaltation in the heavens and the reality that saints are his personal representatives, like I said, ambassadors, with the same Holy Spirit who manifested through his own vessel, he gave this out some promises. Not with false humility. I remember what he said in John chapter 14, verse 12. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also greater works than these he shall do, because I go unto my father. So he said, you can move even greater mountains. There was one story about uh, Archbishop Itawasa. They put a, a crippled man along his way when he was going to his car. A man who never walked all his life. He never said a word. He just said, you follow me to my car. That's like that. <laughs> People had to run away. He was just going to his car. After spending several hours in his office, they put a, a lame man who's never walked. You see this man, he said, you follow me to my car. You know, power, man with power. He just said, follow me to my car. Authority. He never prayed. He never stopped saying, Jesus, no, no, Jesus, nothing. Follow me to my car. Just like that. The man, he was made to hold that minute. Stood up, followed. People ran away like this. He said, this man is not normal. He's not normal. He's not normal. He's, he was normal because he was using his power as a Christian. So it is not only the religiosity that is the limitation. The truth is that to walk in this authority, the basic starting point is to emulate him, to die to self that the Holy Spirit can use the surrendered vessel to do whatever the Lord Jesus Christ would have done. So the issue of dying to ourselves, we must die to ourselves, it's very important. Die to ourselves. That's where humility comes in. So the Omega Church, with which the Lord Jesus Christ will close out the human age, will recapture the true kingdom life and minister across the, uh, the, the earth realm. So as the living of the Babylon and its organizational structures are identified and torn down and broken down, the organic body of Jesus Christ, which operates as a living, loving organism of mutually dependent, which was supposed to be supporting each other, will arise to manifest its head again. We are supposed to be, churches are supposed to be working together. But now we have seen other pastors Others are some, somebody must retire, this one must do this. We we'll see, where is this coming from? Let us, however, take note of the reality that of who the Holy Spirit is. He seals saints into the body of Christ. After convicting them of sin and living and revealing him as the only solution to their sin. He is our only solution to the sin. He transforms us, all saints, from inside out, if you give him the right of way to work through them, through our lively conscience. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. You unite all saints to have a spirit of kingship in the body of Christ. We become children of God in one family. He demonstrates the reality of Jesus Christ. He's always some power through the surrendered and yielded vessels. Not people who boast, me, me, I cannot do anything, I can do anything, no. You humble yourself. Demonstrate, like I said, they will demonstrate the reality of Christ in this power. So the signature of the Holy Spirit upon all believers, his seal happens to come with evidence called the root or basic gifts. 
that's where we are coming in now. Like I said, this basic gift, the nine gifts that we talked about. When, when saints receive the gift of the gift of baptism in Holy Spirit are immersed fully in him, he releases the gifts, charismatic manifestation, which is made possible. So the subject of spiritual gifts is so fundamental to the reality, new life in Christ Jesus. That to ignore it is to go to the spirit of religion and statement. Because of its origin and essence, it is needful to do a systematic study of spiritual, which essentially constitutes the fulcrum of all other factors which make up the unique spiritual DNA of all saints. The need to restore scripture over humanism. We need to come back to the scriptures, back to Bethel. So one of the biggest challenges the kingdom church must confront frontally is the way some, the, some brethren allow their thoughts, ideas, expectations to override their clear provisions of the, of the scriptures. One area where this humanistic mindset is evidently used to great harm is the subject of the work of the Holy Spirit in the church today. Second challenge, two broad groups have emerged when the present day ministry of the Holy Spirit crops up. One of the group is one who insists that the Holy Spirit in this group or these gifts are not for today, having gone out of fashion with the establishment of the church on the day of Pentecost. Some major denominations have built their dogma and the theology on this fallacy. But for the people who said, no, 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 there are no gifts, we don't need it. The second group is a diverse range of gifts of saints who believe that the same Holy Spirit who invaded the earth on the day of Pentecost is relevant to this day, to, to the day-to-day -day life of all saints. However, this seems to be the only point of agreement. From this common ground, a cacophony of voices spring up. That's when, that's when things go haywire now. That's when things start to come up. That's where Pentecostal, um, charismatic, Catholic, everything, apostolic reformation come in. Tongues, everything. There was this funny postulation from one of the, apost uh, one of the leaders of the so-called apostolic reformation that defined speaking in tongue as the capacity to speak in many different languages or the art of linguistics. One sad thing is no one corrected him since he was the Pope of his movement. Such distortions have been fueled by the inability of most Pentecost charismatic to see that it is impossible to save God unacceptably when the rim of the self is actively, uh, actively alive. Like I said, you must die to yourself for you to be able to see or for the Holy Spirit to come out to, for the Holy Spirit to be able to fully manifest. So when the self is alive and well, what ensures is, what ensues is a solishness or worship propelled from the soul, soul, rim or mind, will, emotion rather than from the heart or spirit mind. The Lord Jesus Christ himself taught during his epic encounter with the Samaritan woman that true worship must be premised on the two wings in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. In our, it is our responsibility to stop worshiping God with the corrupt facility of the soul. Our stream of self being where the mind, will, and emotions works why. That's why we can be easily confused. When you listen to yourself, you get confused because that's where the devil comes in again. Remember the Bible says, if any thought exalt itself above the knowledge of Christ, you should put it in captivity. There are thoughts that comes in between. You say, no, 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 this, they come in between. 
they need to be careful. So to achieve this glorious state of true spirituality, saints are called to first deny themselves, take up their own cross, the Luke chapter 9, verse 23, follow Christ to Calvary, where they will be crucified with him, or Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 26, or Galatians chapter 2, two verse 20, the favorite from Pastor C.Y. When our self-life is crucified, we can no longer seek to pursue reputation, fame, wealth. We can no longer seek these things. When you die to yourself, your rights goes away. You are no longer saying, I'm right, I'm insulted, I'm this, no. So crucified saints are dead to themselves, dead to personal ambitions, opinions, dead to desire to be seen, and dead to personal ideologies. Such people are made alive to, by the Holy Spirit who possesses them and determines all they say and do. Not what you think, not what you feel, no. Remember what the Dachini read, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Scriptures are not for private interpretation. Because he is the spirit of truth, the spirit leads such saints into fully understanding of the plan of God for the Church of Christ. It is that glorious plan which certain successfully attacked after the early years of the Alpha. Alpha Church, that is the church that started with, this, with, the, with the apostles. We gave room to the Ephesians concept of the lack of intimacy and the preoccupation with the dead religious works. The end time reformation of the church will begin with the restoration of the Lordship of Christ. For the church to operate the way he intended, there will be a restoration of the foundational, foundational um, synergetic ministries of the fivefold. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. This leadership office gifts that Christ bequeaths to his church cannot function according to the whims and purposes of men. No, remember this is Ephesians chapter four, verse 11 to 16. That is why a restoration of the entity and authority of the Holy Scriptures as a sure foundation of the lives of saints is not negotiable. Sanctification authority of scripture will not be disputable. True apostles, true um, evangelists, true pastors, true teachers will not and cannot teach people from fleshly mind. When you see yourself wanting to, de to define scriptures from, from a fleshly, from, from something fleshly, there is a problem somewhere. There is a flesh, there, there is something wrong. There is something wrong. You have got a serious challenge. You must not teach from the flesh, but rather from there will be the faithful, they will be faithful to the letters and spirit of the word of God. If you but in them alone with the illumination of the Holy Spirit is a very tonic that is sorely needed to bring the true and lasting revival to the church in our generation. The unarguable truth is that there is no genuine revival outside the word of a sister. Whenever the children of God first repair the altar of centrality of the word, the true and lasting fire of revival will ignite again in the saints' passion for holiness, a couple of unity to fulfill the great commission. They go here out, go here out making disciples of men. The Matthew chapter 28, verse 17 to 20, Mark chapter 16, verse 16 to 20. So the congregation that God will use to bring this, past, you can just write them and check them. I'll be just giving them as they come. At first that I was just trying to look at the thing is Mark, so Ezekiel chapter 16, verse eight. 
you can chat as I was trying to put it. The congregation that God will use to bring this to pass in the city or a region shall not be measured in terms of size, budget, age, eloquence. What will mark out the congregation rather is a discovery of the true concept of a church. The church did not start, church started from homes. Church started from self. You know, problem is people think that when we start, we build a, a, a small building, we rent a small apartment, we call it a church. No. Four people are gathered in your house. That was just, that is what people call the church. Not uh, come to come into my house, let's call it a church. Three hours you are, you are drinking coffee there. Let us make coffee. You know, those are the things that really irritate me. The devil come through the bed door. He said, we, we, we wanted to pray. Four hours you are there, he said, ah, it was good. The devil is cheating you, you are calling it love, you are, you are spending four hours doing nothing. You wanted to learn the Bible, say yes. Here you are, you are calling it love. It's witchcraft. He has come through the back door to steal that which you are supposed to learn. If it is coffee, call it coffee. You have got tea in your place, you are coming to drink coffee here. Coffee that can be taken five, 10 minutes. There you are, you are spending 10, 20 minutes. Let, let us just watch a film one hour. You are watching a film. Film that you can watch at your place is that you are coming to watch here. See how people are easily deceived. Instead of learning the Bible, teaching, let us discuss, let us learn together. If there are things that we don't understand, then you pray. You have learned something. A little each day makes a lot in a year. There you are. You are busy saying, yeah, yeah, it is good that you, we, we, we are just putting the Bible there for display. I had the same thing. We had some moments, some moments visiting, four hours just sitting there. Four solid hours. He said, I asked my wife, said, four hours, time wasting. No Bible, nothing, nothing, nothing. Four solid hours. I said, what are they doing? I said, you call it love? It's witchcraft. The devil is just coming to take time away from you. And say, I don't have time, I'm tired. You need to manage time. You need to lead. You need, you know, there are certain things you don't have to say, I, I'm being nice for what? There are certain things you need, you need discipline. You can have somebody say, come, if you are not discussing Bible, what are we doing? You're coming for coffee to drive 45 kilometers to come and just take my time. Time is money. These are the people that call you time is money. And now they are coming here to come to, 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 to sit for five hours. After they are tired, the next thing so they are coming, sucking your life, love your life, sucking your spirit out of your, your life out of your spirit. The next thing said, I'm tired. We need to be wiser than that. Wisdom is needed. So, like I said, um, we'll soon be finishing. I was just introducing how the gifts come about. So from the, for the church to function as a congregation of the called out, like I said, the called out, that is what the church is. The called out is the ecclesia, this is the Greek word. Ecclesia means the church called out. The Lord has endowed a number of supernatural abilities known as spiritual gifts and spiritual gifts. It is interesting to see that in so many in many so-called living churches, spiritual offices has been jettisoned in favor of carnal titles. Titles are more important now. This in itself is largely based on the transmutation of a simple concept of the church from what the Lord Jesus Christ had in mind to, do, to, to what men deem convenient in these humanistic called denominations because denominations in the divisive competitive DNA are not part of the plan of the Lord's church. They've largely done more harm than good. Denominations have been misled 
by the enemy to subtly and overtly divide the church. Instigated strife, comp competition decimated the strength of the kingdom. So in order to, sub to sustain their humanistic agenda, denominations first have to discard the simple scriptural models in favor of complex religious systems which create an aura of divinity. They come more like there's something complex, you know, they come, I've got a PhD in, in, in theology, I'm a reference to said rubbish, absolute rubbish, nonsense. I don't need to reference something. I'm more reference than Christ himself is, who, who is the super referent. No, what nonsense. Church offices and titles are created outside what is the holy reach to minister human ego. I will show you something about referent. I have taught about it several times. Scriptural passages concerning spiritual gifts. There are a number of um, there are a number of uh, spirit, um, passages concerning spiritual gifts. So there, there are a number of passages in which scriptures which clearly spell out spiritual gifts and their range. Holy Script, Holy Spirit used Paul the apostle to lay out the subject in greater detail in a number of passages. Romans chapter twelve, verse one to eight. First Corinthians chapter twelve, from verse one to eight, and First Corinthians chapter thirteen. So Apostle Paul was used to warn that spiritual gifts amount to nothing when they are not exercised in love. When they are not exercised in love, they are absolute nothing. They are nothing. Let me quickly, there's something that I wanted to read. Where was this? I want to read something from the Bible. Let me think what I wanted to read concerning this. I, I think I wanted to read something from, for you from the Bible. Let me think of what I wanted to read for you. So further clarity on the matter is found in Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, which um, on the offices, which is... The, the, the fivefold offices which sent us on how the need for unity is enhanced. If there's no unity in the body of Christ, the gifts are misused, deception comes in, and people cannot um, discover their individual gifts, use them to build up others as they are em empowered by leaders operating in the fivefold office so that the body is empowered by what every joint supplies. It's very important. So as we'll be going, so what are we going to be talking about now? What are we going to be talking about? What is a spiritual gift? How many spiritual gifts are mentioned in the Bible? What spiritual gifts are implied and in what context in the Bible, like I said, we are not going to run away from the Bible. How are spiritual gifts utilized? What are the ways to discover our spiritual gifts? What do spiritual gifts say of the ministry of the Lord call us to? In other words, what is the core relation between spiritual gifts and ministry? What are the dangerous dangers operating outside our spiritual gifts? You are called as a pastor, you are busy prophesying. This is, calling people. this is what I see in your life because you like prophecy, want people to come to you too much. This is a, ah, this, this. Is the presence and exercise of spiritual gifts efficient basis for success in ministry? If not, what are the essentials needful to fulfill ministry? So these are the questions that we'll be tackling. We'll be going about each and every. Then we'll do what you call impartation, activation. If you have what gifts that you have, we'll still, there, there are more gifts that will be added. There are gifts that can be added. If you have got word of knowledge, word of wisdom, they cannot be added. 
faith, it cannot be added. Spirit of discernment cannot be added. Gifts of tongues, they can be added. There are gifts that can be added. You can speak in thousands of tongues. Interpretation of tongues can be added because you cannot interpret all tongues. You cannot interpret many people that will be speaking. You are only given thus far. Not everybody that you can interpret. So all those things, you will be... The Bible verse that I was just trying to... It's this one. Ezekiel 16 verse 8. Now, when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, the thy time was thy, was the time of love. And I spread thy skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a confidence with thee, said the Lord, thy God, thou became. So our God is a God that loves us. What I wanted to tell us when God calls us, as his servants, as his saints. He knows us by name. He is just telling us, don't call people, don't frighten people to come into ministry by fear. Let people respond to his love. Remember the John chapter 4, verse 23 to 24. God is a spirit. Let people come more out of fear. We have seen that people have respond, responded to fear, not out, not out of love. So let them come in love. Say, God, let me respond to love that made you to leave your place in heaven, to come and offer yourself as a sacrifice. Teach me to respond to your love, not out of fear. God does not want to be feared, God wants to be loved. Oh, this is the part I wanted to read for you, please. I've thought about it, this one. Just, I'm rounding up. I just wanted you to know this thing so that tomorrow people ask you so that you know where it is in the Bible. Follow me to the book of Psalm 111. Psalm 111. I'll read for you, then I'll, re I'll read, it's only 10 verses. Praise ye, Lord, I'll praise thee, I'll praise the Lord with my, with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation too. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of them, all of them that have pleasure therein. Three, his work is honorable and glorious and his righteousness endureth forever. I wanted, to, I wanted to pay attention, very close attention from three. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth forever. Four. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered, and the Lord is glorious and gracious and full of compassion. Five. He hath given meat unto them that fear him, and he will forever, he will ever be mindful of his confidence. Five, he hath showed his people pow the power of his works, and he hath given them the heritage of the heaven. Are you following? Seven, the works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. Eight. All his commandments are sure. I wanted, I wanted to be sure, right? All his commandments are sure. I, I wanted to start seeing which person we are talking about. Eight. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth. Who stands forever and ever? There's only one person who stands forever and ever. Nine. He sent redemption unto his people. He, he had commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend, and reverend is his name. I want you to get it now. He sent redemption unto his people. He had commanded his covenant forever. 
holy and reverent is his name. The word that you call say reverend, reverend is the name of Jesus Christ. If you read or from what you've been reading up, the number eight, they stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and righteousness. These things they describe the Lord Jesus Christ. Reverend is his name. No earthly man should call themselves reverend. They can do it out of mischief. That's what the Bible is saying. See what the Bible says. He had showed his people the power of his works that he may give them the heritage of the heaven. Seven, the works of his hands are very in judgment. All his commandments are sure. Whose commandments are sure? Can the commandments of human beings be sure? No. They stand fast forever. Commandments of human beings stand for sure forever? No. And forever. And are done in truth and righteousness. Revelation chapter 19, verse 18. When you read these things, you can be sure it's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all they that do his commandment, his praise in purity forever. The word reverend itself, stop using it and say, ah, reverend, reverend, I'm not a reverend. 